live and recording. This is Constance from Mysterious Galaxy. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I am very excited because tonight we have JT Ellison and we are celebrating her dark lies and she is going to be in conversation with Lisa Unger. And just to give you a little information on these amazing authors, JT is the New York Times and USA Today best-selling author of more than 20 novels and the Emmy award-winning co-host of A Word on Words, Nashville's premier literary show, which shout out to Nashville, that's where I'm from, that's my hometown, so woohoo! <laughs> woo <-hoo>. <laughs> With millions of books in print, her work has won critical acclaim, prestigious awards, and has been published in 26 countries. And then Elisa Unger is the New York Times bestselling and internationally bestselling author of 18 novels, including Confessions on the 745. With millions of readers worldwide and books published in 26 languages, Unger is widely regarded as a master of suspense. Her critically acclaimed books have been <laughs> voted best of the year or top picks of the Today Show. I have to do a dramatic voice, like with dramatic titles. It just that was calls very dramatic. for it. It's it. necessary, but just to give everyone a little bit, now that we have our formal bios out of the way, JT's Her Dark Lies is, oh my goodness, it's just so dark and twisty. And so it begins with you're on the coast of Italy, beautiful paradise. There's a marriage happening on an island. Yes, this is exactly the perfect Vanna White moment. Picture the coast, beautiful island. And, and then things start to go not so great because some people are there for a marriage and you know there might be like a dead body that's found and the power might go out. Everyone might not Storm. survive this Storm's story. Coming. Exactly, you know, paradise does not, um, it doesn't really stay um, like paradise for such a long time. That is all I'm going to tell you for I'm going to pass it off to Lisa and JT to discuss more. But before I do ye old house rules to the right hand side, as everyone may have a feel for, is our general chat section. I see all the love for our amazing authors. Thank you so much, guys. And then down below, if you look down below, there is a beautiful magical button that says, ask a question. And as that would imply, that is indeed where you can ask our authors questions. If you just click that button, it will pop up where you can ask questions. That's the best part of events. The authors are at your mercy, so make sure to pry their author brains with whatever questions you may have. And then also, of course, to support these authors, I highly recommend you purchase their books. So you can purchase Her Dark Lies and other titles. Wait, Her Dark Lies and other titles by clicking the Purchase Books <laughs> button down below. And shout out to Tori. Hello, Tori. We love you, Tori. We said hello when we saw your comment Hi, earlier, too. Hi, Tori. But on that note, I am going to go ahead and pass it off to Lisa, and I will see you guys at the end of the event. Have an amazing talk. Thank you. Oh, she's gone, and she's gone. She's <laughs> gone. Bye, Constance. It's that was ma amazing ma magic. Yeah, I know. Hello, friend. The magic Hello, of friend. mysterious galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> she's still, don't, that's scary. Don't do that. <laughs> I just um, put my phone on. Airplane mode, just in case. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a good idea. Well, I'm sure my phone will ring since you did that, but I'm not gonna. I'm not even gonna try. It. So I'm just gonna do a little housekeeping. First of all, I'm just gonna say we turned off the chat bar because we've decided that we can't um, talk to each other and watch the chat because then it would be me going <laughs> the chat. <laughs> but I will at the <laughs> at the 35 minute mark. I will go to the ask a question button, and then I'll try to get to as many questions as I can. But hello, friend! Congratulations on the release of her dark lies. Her dark lies. <laughs> um, I love, as you know, I I absolutely love this book. I thought it was just um, so elegant and and beautiful and atmospheric and suspenseful and just, you know, completely riveting from cover to cover. I just loved everything about it, but you are, you already knew that. You're sweet. And um, how's it been going? How's the, how's the virtual tour? How it has been... been a blast. Yeah, it's fun, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Cause you just did this for yours. I did. Confession on the 745. Yeah, You kind I of did. paved the way for all of us. You, I know we're using your best, best practices. 
to see what's going to work and what's not. So thank yeah. you for, for, you know, fording the river first. Yeah, I actually really, I enjoyed it because I felt like, you know, I mean, obviously when you go out on the road, you get to connect with people and, and booksellers and librarians mm -hmm. and your readers and you get to connect with them like, you know, and hug them and sign their books. And there's something, you know, really beautiful about that. But like, I think in some ways, I feel like people who maybe have never been to a book signing or couldn't get to a book signing for certain reasons or, you know, whose market you may you may never visit, finally get to come and hang out with you and, and talk with you in your office, which with your, like, I'm look, just looking at your shelves, like with your Emmy back there and like your, <laughs> your, I mean, your books or whatever. So they get to like hang out with you, like in your office, which I think is kind of, you know, it's cool in its own way too. So thanks everybody for being here and, you know, for sort of following us along um in this crazy path that we're all kind of on together um so i guess we should probably talk about her dark lies <laughs> so uh, we've talked a lot about process and about where things come from and where you know like the sort of the germ of an idea and how it how from that like little piece like that moment how a novel um, sort of grows. So do you want to tell us a little bit about, you know, sort of the seed or the germ for this book and how it evolved in, in the writing? Sure. So um, Her Dark Lies is the story of, of a young, large oil format painter who is just starting to get her feet under her as an artist who meets the man of her dreams, 10 years older than her widower, Jack Compton, from an incredibly wealthy family just this amazing guy that you can't even imagine being a part of this world. She doesn't know who he is when, when they get together. He actually gives her a false name and it's not for three weeks of dating until he actually tells her who he is. Um, and, and they are getting ready to go off on their wedding weekend on his family's private island. And it's just supposed to be this wonderful, amazing weekend and of course, it doesn't turn out that way because it's a J.T. Ellison novel, so things have to go dreadfully wrong. Of course. <laughs> but the the idea <laughs> for it, yeah, of course. Um, I was, uh, there were two, it's a two-pronged thing. One, I was listening to Rebecca, and mm -hmm. a question came to me that I was listening to see if it was answered. I've read the book before a number of times, but I never mm -hmm. listened to it. And, and that's experiencing it on a completely different level. Right, like the audio book. Right, the audio book. Yeah. Because I just wanted to experience it in a new way. I've just recently in the past couple of years gotten into audio books. So I'm, I'm re-listening the things that I love just to experience yeah. it. So a question came to me and I it was not answered. And I was like, huh, okay, that might be an interesting story to pursue. And at the same time, we were in Italy for my big birthday. Um, and we were on Lake Como. And there's an your island. Your 40th, your 40th birthday. It was my 25th. Come on. Oh, I'm sorry. It was my sweet 16. Lisa. <laughs> oh my God. Lisa. Sorry. Did you see my princess crown? It was my sweet 16. Come on. You're so cute. I love your princess crown. <laughs> yeah. So my tiara is up here, somewhere up here. Yeah. Right anyway. Your Emmy. Yeah. No, the, the cheers. <laughs> it is up there. It anyway. Is. Oh, it's around my throat. There it is. It's around the thriller. <laughs> See? Oh, there we go. Perfect. I have a crown. You should see me in a crown. Okay. So we're, we're in Italy. Rebecca, this, the island. For this big okay, birthday, okay. and there's this island called Comacina across from our hotel. And I did a little bit of research on it. It had some really cool haunted legacy to it. Mm. For example, you had to drink a certain kind of coffee before you leave the island, or the demons of the island will follow you home. I was oh, like, nice. this is awesome. I'm yeah. going to use this. I need to use this. This is really cool. And so I took the question from Rebecca and I took this setting and I uh, mashed them together and came up with the story. And it changed. Uh, it, you know, this was not the easiest book I've ever written in my life. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It changed a number of times. The The plot changed. The characters changed. The characters changed names. <laughs> I mean, literally, <laughs> this, this one just didn't want to uh, didn't want to play ball. But yeah. in the end, it did, and it is what it is, and I'm I'm really glad it was a fun experience. Well, yeah, you would never know. I mean, when in the reading of it, it's so completely 
seamless. And so you'd never know that you sort of, I mean, I guess nobody ever knows like how we struggle with various plot points or characters or whatever. At least, at least you hope that people don't know. What do you mean? <laughs> Yeah, do the readers really want to know how the sausage is made? Because you don't I mean, want to know. they'll tell you, <laughs> you really but it's really not pretty. Not a pretty thing. Uh, <laughs> exactly. So I, I mean, it was just, it just felt very, it felt very seamless, and everything just really flowed, and in, in a, in a, um, just almost like just a like a very magical, romantic, like very, and I could really, I could really feel your, you know, your your passion for history. And also for art, um, because I, you know, just early, I guess, well, I don't know, it's hard to even know when it was, but in the last few months, at least, I read, you sent me a short story that I thought was so brilliant. And I was like wondering this sort of, there's a theme I, that, you know, that threads through both the, your brilliant short story and also this is like, you know, the whole theme of art and how art is in, in, in this story is being used in a, in a sort of a, without giving too much away, in a very like sort of about to be used in kind of a nefarious way. But do you want to talk a little bit about art and about your, so how you did some of the research for this mm -hmm. island and the, and, the, and the book? Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So the island is completely made up. Yeah. The history of the island, the provenance of the island, all of that is, is from my imagination. I, I wrote a Condé Nast article about the island so I could get an idea of what it was yeah. going to be like. And yeah, that made it in the book. I think it was. I a wondered day. about that because it's it <laughs> so it felt so vibrant, and so I was like, so and so it just felt so real. It was it was one of those days where the word count was just not there, but that was going to bump me over. <laughs> so I I went ahead and took it from my notes and put it in the manuscript, and it stayed. So you yeah. know, it was, it was one of those. But it is this island is is astounding and it's got an artist colony on it and it's uh, uh, one of the people who's in the family is a grand cinematographer art permeates everything about the story yes. they're collectors they love it um they you know they understand the sacrifices that need to be made to be an artist and they respect mm -hmm. that and they i mean they've got then they love modern art which is i love modern art that is my jam mm -hmm. um i can't i'm not an artist at all i would mm. love to be an artist i would like to be an oil painter yeah. oh my yes. gosh it would be so magical i mean i would jackson pollock the out of it you know right but i don't <laughs> I censored myself, aren't you proud of me? Um, I don't know how to paint. I don't know how to draw. I don't know how to do any of that. As a matter of fact, I'd never even really put oil to a canvas until I was writing this. And I was on tour for my last book and I was staying with my best friend from high school and her husband's a painter. And I said, hey, can we break open one of your oils and screw with the canvas a little bit so I can see you know, what it feels like and what it smells like. And that really made a huge difference for who yeah. Claire is because she sees things almost in a synesthesia. Everything right. she sees is the colors that she would paint it, which was a yeah. really fun aspect of this character. And I really love the way, you know, um, how you sort of use her art to illustrate her obsession with Morgan how Morgan starts to sort of, you know, show up in the, you know, it's not necessarily a painting of her, but she's like, you know, the, her hair and different pieces of her start to, to show up in her art. I, I, that was it one does. of the things. So most. Morgan, for the, for the folks who, who wouldn't know, Morgan is Jack Compton's dead ex-wife. Yeah. She, it, well, yeah, ex because she's dead. Dead, dead well, first yeah. wife. I mean, I should ex, say. dead, dead whatever. First wife. <laughs> she, he, they weren't divorced. <laughs> she died while they were married. They had not been married for very long, and uh, she died in a boating accident. Um, and and it's something that they never discuss. So Jack won't talk to Claire about Morgan at all. Um, right. And so she has to find out everything she can about her through her own research and she does that through the internet and she becomes really rather obsessed with this woman. And it does, I mean, every little thing, th little things about her start making their way into Claire's art. Yeah. Yeah. You I, can I be haunted. That, you can be haunted. Yeah, I found people. that, I found that really interesting. You know, it kind of made me think about like, 
you know, um, you know, just the, the sort of the reimagining of the story, you know, quite, you know, the question of, you know, Rebecca, the, the original like sort of inspiration, it also kind of made me think of, um, there was another book called the uh, Wide Sargasso Sea. Yes. And it was the, you know, it was a, the question about who in, of, of Jane Eyre, who was this poor, this poor woman that would happen, <laughs> that just happened to be locked up in the room. It was like so inconvenient for everyone that she was up there, but like, who was she? You know, like it just sort of recasting, you know, asking different questions about classic stories under the, you know, under the magnifying glass of mm -hmm. who we are now, what we know. So I, I found that part of it really, really fascinating as well. I mean, it's wholly original, wholly your own, of course, but, you know, like just having that one little piece that comes forward from something that we all sort of love as readers, I think most of us are sort of in love with that book a little bit. Oh, sure. And I mean, you've, you've nailed it. You've nailed what the yeah. question is. Who is this person really through? Yeah. You're, you only see Rebecca through the lens of all the yeah. characters in the book. But who is she exactly. really? We you don't know. You never see her. You never see. And then even in, in Rebecca, like, you never know the, the woman, you know, the wife, the new wife. You never even learn her name. Right. You know, it's just this strange, you know, this strange, whether it was intentional or not, but, you know, it's just these, there's so many questions that, you know, I think that, you know, as writers, you know, we, we wind up at, after you've read a book two and three and four times in your life, these questions kind of come up and you almost can't help in some, in some sense, but try to answer them for yourself on the page. Sure. I, yeah. I, I can't believe that you brought up White Sargasso Sea because that is one of my favorite books. And that is, that is, is Jean Reese's love letter to uh, Jane Eyre. Yeah, and it's it's yeah. certainly not a retelling. It's just what happened. Not at all. You know what exactly. happened? What made this what woman happened? mad? A, you know how did this happen? Yeah. And yeah. that's I, I that's exactly the kind of uh, approach that I took to this. Just you know, there are elements, and there are elements of Ripley that you know I I don't right. know the whole story. I listen. I was listening to Ripley as well. Um, just there are elements of these great classics that are never answered. And right. I wanted you can't, to. I mean, no, you can't answer all the questions. You can't, you know, even like, you know, I'm sure from your own work, you get, you know, you get email and stuff from people saying, well, what happened here and what happened to X? And it's like, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Like, yeah, what do you think story, happened? The story didn't, the story didn't go there, you know, and it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of an interesting, you know, I mean, like, story, stories have a life of their own. There are only so many, there are only so many places where you can, go with your story within the confines of, of a novel and then like maybe if there's still another thread then maybe that's why we wind up you know i know if there's a character that's still with me and still something happened and it's still bothering me then i know that there's another book with that character but you can't follow all you know you can't follow all the stories and i think it's very telling of the time and the culture you know what stories come to the forefront and you know then in another culture and another writer looks at that same story and says okay there's another path that we can we can follow here and that's how i felt about her dark lies i thought it was like such an interesting like sort of you know um just taking you there but like in a totally original totally original way thank you you see, you no, all people you. would understand what I was doing. I knew you would understand. I do. It. I totally do. <laughs> well, the other thing I thought was so interesting, and I, it's, it's difficult to kind of talk about everything just because you don't want to give too much away. But there was a real, like, sort of tech, kind of like espionage type layer to the book as well. And there was like so much rich detail and interesting ideas about you know, how Claire's art was going to be used and the Compton's family, Compton family's intentions. Um, and I just wondered, you know, about, you know, your research for some of that, because you seem to have like such a strong command of those ideas. And did it come from somewhere? Does it come from your history and politics or things that you just kind of <laughs> read about and heard and... <laughs> just tell us, JT, tell us your secrets. I could tell you, but then I would have to kill you. Oh, I know. <laughs> no, I I love that stuff. I just, you know, yeah, the James Bondy kind of stuff is just fascinating to me. I love yeah. doing that kind of research. I read about that kind of stuff all the time. I like the the, you know, it's maybe not quite possible now, but it will be soon. 
Yeah. Um, there's a couple of places online that I read that are, you know, forward looking futurism, you know, just where, yeah. where are we going? I grew up in an right. aerospace family and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. they're always looking at how are we going to get to space and to the moon and to Mars and to, you know, they're always looking a little bit in the future. And my dad's a yeah. huge sci-fi reader. And yeah. I think that influence absolutely has sprinkled itself yeah. into, into me and the things that I like and the things that I find interesting. I mean, I, oh, I would love to be a computer hacker. It would be right. so fascinating. Yeah, and I really like secretly want to be a science fiction writer too. Like there are just certain things that like the world is just, it's just too damn weird. The world is yeah. just too weird. You cannot, you cannot make this stuff up. No. No, not at all. And, and, like and it's, it's surpassed. Life is stranger than art. Fiction writers. It always is. I mean, it, life is stranger than yeah. art. There's nothing that we can come up with that doesn't find a way to happen in the real world. It's 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 fascinating. And and we are, you know, moving sequentially towards all of these elements that are happening. And and it's, you know, yeah. look at the vaccine. It's an mRNA vaccine it's it's right you know designed it's a designer vaccine and that's how all the cancer treatments are right now and you yes. know we really are making all these huge strides medically yeah. and yeah. you know people have been writing about that for years like they you, you gotta wonder do they imagine it and then scientists try to make it happen that's what i've always wondered yeah, I always wonder about that too. Or, or, or are science fiction writers or, or some science fiction writers almost in a sense prophets, you know, like they can see how things are right. progressing. Like I, I, when I was a book publicist, I worked with William Gibson um, and, you know, they, he was like the person who invented the idea of cyberspace, right? And yeah. it's like, but he just as a person, you just as an extremely brilliant human being, like he could just—he seemed to be able to see how things were gonna were gonna flow and how they were gonna how they were gonna change, and the books kind of reflected that. So I wonder, you know, I always wonder about that too. Like, are kids in, like kids inspired by science fiction, and then they grow up to be scientists that like make these things happen, or are these like science fiction writers just have some kind? They have their finger on the pulse of like what we're going to become, or how the the technologies that we have are going to um are gonna uh you know evolve and change and change and change us and change the world so it's the i mean who knows what the answer is i don't know sci-fi writers have always had their pulse on where we're yeah. headed for sure very much so very much so well speaking of the vaccine so we've all you know we're still in this crazy time but obviously some of us are you know writing novels during you know during this pandemic so how did it how did it affect your writing process like how did i mean most of we're okay so just full disclosure here we're writers so we're basically hermits to begin with <laughs> right <yeah>. so you <laughs> like we're barely dressed as it is so like you know for i guess for me like as you know as an introvert or yeah i always think of myself as an extreme introvert you know, it wasn't in in that sense, like not that huge a change for me in terms of process. But how was it? Um, how was it for you? Like, how did it affect your your the writing of the book and the publishing of the book and all of that? It was. I mean, I'm the same way. I'm an extreme introvert. I've been incredibly blessed that things haven't changed dramatically for me. I don't have kids, so I haven't had to homeschool. Um, it, and I think that's been probably a major change for most families um, that have children mm -hmm. is they've got to deal with, you know, how do we how do we get the kids educated and keep safe and, and, and just get how do we do with the families and get everyone this. Yeah. right. How do you help them metabolize it? Exactly. Yeah. So that wasn't a problem for me. I was just distracted. I mean, horribly distracted. Right. How can you not? Yeah. Be? You know, it's it's a daily it, things were evolving so quickly that you would wake up in the morning and in the evening, you know, something else horrific had happened and it yeah. really, you know, parked in my brain for a while. And I had to go and house sit and get into a completely different environment to kind of shake myself free to, mm -hmm. to figure all of this out. Right. And, and I, once I did that, actually the book came together rather quickly but I did. I needed to literally go somewhere else and get away mm -hmm. from my world. Um, and I was I was obviously lucky enough to be able to do that. And it made a huge difference. 
but as far as the day to day, you know, yeah, yeah. it's not that different. Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, like, obviously I have a teenager and, you know, I, I, I just kept trying to say to her and I was also saying to myself, like, this is, you know, even though we're struggling with various things that we've lost and disappointments, at least we're still able to work and, you know, that we're safe and, you know, haven't right. been sick and all that. So like just trying to stay in that place of, you know, gratitude and try to, mm-hmm. for me, it's a writing's always, um, is an escape hatch, right? It's the place where I go <laughs> when yeah. things get really, when things get really crazy, it's where I metabolize, you know, sort of the chaos that, that I perceive in the world. So I kind of found, I, I kind of found a little bit of refuge in the creativity. And then also, you know, we had talked about, you and I, I have talked a lot about Cal Newport and the book, uh, Deep Work. And it was a lot of the, a lot of those things, you know, batching creative time and staying away, staying away as much as possible from, Mm -hmm. you know, the toxic sludge that we were all sipping from the news and, you know, all that time. (laughs) All the news. (laughs) All the news, all the news. So like, it was just sort of that, that really, that really helped me a lot during this time. You want to, you want to hear something crazy? Yeah. Obviously things are starting to come to an end, right? We're starting yeah. to get to the point where we are going to be able to do the things that we used to do. And yes. I've, I've actually yeah. had a couple of moments of mourning for this mm-hmm. time because yeah. I didn't set any expectations. I, I wrote a pandemic book and I wrote half of another pandemic book. So great, right? right? But it has been a time of great introspection for me. And Absolutely. it's yeah. really allowed me to take a breath, to kind of reassess what I'm doing with my life, with my career, with my editorial stream, with all the things that I want to do. And that's coming to a close. And so as much as I'm ready to see it in my rear view, there's still right. an element of, oh, okay, well, I'm not going to be able to say, oh, I can't because, you know, pandemic. Right. <laughs> oh, right. I didn't work today because, pand- you know, all, all of that right. is going to shift. But I'm right. curious when we talk next year at this time, right. Right. how we're affected by reintegrating into this world. Right. And how much, I mean, because for as much as it's been for you, you have to imagine this is also true of everybody else. Like this has been, you know, if you've used the time, it's been a time of introspection, Mm -hmm. right? Like you've taken the time to, uh, if you've had that luxury, let's just put it that way. If you've had the luxury of a time of of introspection, then um, you definitely, um, taken stock of, you know, where you are in your life and what you're doing and what you want to be doing. So I feel like that is an energy that everybody, uh, many people have experienced. So I'll be interested to see, you know, what has come forward from this time, what has changed forever and what we just, you know, immediately kind of grab back, you know, and don't ever want to let go of again. So it'll be interesting to see like how, how those things, how those things evolve and you said you worked on another. You were working on another, but you wrote this book and half of your next book during this pandemic time. Mm-hmm. So you spent some good time with your with your characters. Yeah, and I, yeah, and I could see you know very much so see that in this book. So there and there's you know and and actually the, one of the things I love about this book and one of I love books that have multiple perspectives books that are like mosaics you know and that the story is told from you know different different people and different pieces it's like one of my favorite ways to tell a story and it's one of my favorite ways to read a story so and we all know that we like sort of have relationships with our characters and some of them we like a little bit better than others and some of them are (laughs) yes for sure some of them them are you know this doesn't mean we don't love them we just may not always agree or like them very much um but so how talk to me a little bit about some of the characters in this book like who was your like kind of I mean you don't want to say favorite but just the person that you felt the closest to in the writing and who was the person that you just kind of felt like man if I had to sit at a table with you we would not be having a good time (laughs) well honestly and it's terrible to say this but Claire was the one that I just really had trouble with Um, yeah tell me about that she she 
she knew that I was going to be that nosy friend that wanted to know her deepest yeah. secrets. I wanted to be her best friend. I wanted her to tell me everything. And I wanted that to happen really, really fast. <laughs> um, and Are she, we sure this is the right guy for you, Claire? Let's just, let's just talk about this. <laughs> let's talk you know what why why aren't you asking him about his ex right. wife, we know he's dead wife. What, you know, what's he's what's going pilot, on here you know yeah, is, so right. katie who is her best friend was the most fun yeah. because she yeah. was the one who was really me in the book going hey 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 hello hello something's not right here <laughs> and claire's just like floating above it all she is right. marrying the man of her dreams and step off, right? Get out of my right. way. I'm doing the thing that I want to do. But she right. would not tell me what her biggest secret was. Mm. And it's something that even Katie, her best friend from day one, they've known each other since school. Even Katie doesn't know this secret. And it was something right. that's rather magnificently huge and horrible. And right. I understand why she didn't want anyone to know. Yeah. I didn't find out what it was until I wrote the scene where she said what it was. And, and I was just, I, I was just blown away. Right. I literally, I remember just going, Oh my God. Yeah. Well, now I understand. And once I knew right. that, then she came to life for me and I was able to go back in yeah. and, and make all the things that weren't working work. But right. wow, she right. was, she was a tough nut to crack. And it's, yeah. you know, we talk about them like, they're real, like they have control. They are real. Over they are but they real. do, right? I mean, have you ever yeah. had a character that just would not tell you who they were? Well, yeah. I mean, I've, I, so that, I mean, very much so the way I write, and we talked about this before, <laughs> is that, you know, my plot, all my plots flow from character. And so, and I meet these people on the page, you know, usually very early on. I, I don't know anything about them. You know, they reveal themselves to me. As I write, I, I learned about them much in the same way that my um, that my readers do, and I, um, you know, I can't imagine any other relationship with them other than one that evolves the way a relationship with any person would would evolve. You know, you get to know, hi, I'm JT. Hi, you're so pretty. Yeah. <laughs> And then you really, that's when you really, after the drinks start flowing, that's when you really get to know each other. So like, that's kind of how it feels for me with my, with my characters. And, uh, and so the plot always flows from them. And there, you know, certainly there have been, you know, have been characters that were way more veiled than others. And it was really like, as you say, like, you know, for me, a lot of my, my process, um, you know, a lot of, th it's deeply subconscious. So a lot of myself works itself out in my sleep. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of like 3 a.m. wake ups like, oh, my God, like, <laughs> like a lot of that. So especially like getting towards the end of the book, there's a, a lot of those nights. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I really relate to that, like that, you know, you just kind of go, oh, OK, I get it. Now I get it. Now I really now get I, it. Now I really get <laughs> it. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And so who was like your most, like, so the best, the best friend was your like most favorite person. Was, was there somebody else that you kind of, how did you feel about Jack? Oh, I love Jack. I mean, I, yeah. I, you know, he was, he was Prince Charming. He, he yeah. really, you know, just a genuinely good I mean, guy. There's, a, there's layers. He's not just like Prince Charming. He's got, there's some layers. Well, sure. Right. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course he's not you like really that, you like the Charlie. bad you like the bad boys, JT. I know that about you. Well, sure. I mean, he, yes, he is an incredibly no. complex guy, but on the surface, yeah. he looks like Prince Charming, and that's yeah. you know, he was a lot of fun to write because he does have a lot of layers. He um, does. He has a lot of layers. Harper, her sister, Claire's sister, Harper. Oh yeah, who, yeah. the social media influencer, yeah. photographer. Uh, you know, wearing her studded Louboutins and then she's just this, you know, adopted New Yorker who is yeah. really not happy about what's going on. And, and yeah. so she's I actually started a social media feed for her, her Harper Hunt's life, that that's her yeah. social media Instagram feed um, that's yeah. made her famous. I actually built her an Instagram feed and was 
building it as I was going on through the book. So I could really That's see cool. where she yeah. had been and what she, I mean, she was much more accessible to me than Claire was. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, it's so interesting. It's just like an interesting relationship that we have with, uh, with our character friends. Yeah. I mean, you know, we live with them for yeah, months. Like, they're real, they're real people. They, they, we, they are, we There's are actualizing them. Else. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. I think so. Anyway. Um, well, we're at, um, we're at the 35 minute mark, wow. believe, which is insane, but I wonder, should you think I should open up to some questions? Sure. Sure. Let's okay. see what, let's I'm see what the questions it. are. Can you okay. find them? I can. I can. I'm going to find them. I'm going to sit back and let you ask. <gasps> okay. Oh, I like this one. This is a really good one. It's at the top. Um, which scene or section brought you the most joy to write? Oh, the end. Yeah. Yeah. There's the, um, without giving anything away, there's a, a, a pulling back of the veil moment For sure. that I knew I was building up to and I was waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting to write it. And when I got there and that tapestry was there, oh, I was so excited. And, and yeah. <laughs> I just, I couldn't wait to do that. I did not know how it was going to end, but I knew where I wanted my yes. big climax to happen. Right. And so that was, the end was really, really fun. Also, the, the very beginning when they're coming up to the island and Claire sees the island for the first time and we see yeah. the island through her eyes um, was yeah. really magnificent. You know, it's just this amazing place. And that was really fun. That was really yeah, fun. Yeah, I, really I really felt that very, very vividly. Like I had a very vivid sense of the island, you know, and I feel like I probably had more of a sense of it because it was from your imagination than I would have if it had been a real place. Like, just because somehow your like sort of fantasy of it communicated itself to me so, so clearly. I don't know if that makes That's, any sense. It does. I've, I've been astounded actually this week. People have said how alive the island was to them. Yes. And I think it is because it was, someplace that I had to create and I maybe layered in even more than I would ever do with a regular setting. Exactly. Just so you could see the dripping wisteria and the yeah, exactly. lemons and the, the size of softballs and the, and the right. flowers. Exactly. You know, all of yeah. that just really I needed to set the stage for myself. So I knew yeah. where everything was happening. And knowing you like I know your passion for things like you know, um, like Harry Potter and um, what Outlander. Yep. Like I know your like passion for those things, and like I really felt that like that sort of, you know, that kind of just beautiful big fantasy of a place that is like you know is just hyper real. You know, like so I, I felt that I felt that as well. I found that very it brought me a lot of joy. I'm sure it brought you a lot of joy to write <laughs> as a reader and also world building <laughs> is fun. It is really, and that was quite it literal, is. the first real world building I had done. I, it's the first time I've yeah. ever made up a setting. And oh boy, am I yeah. drunk with the power. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is, uh, it, 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 it's really, it's very vivid and just beautifully drawn. Thank you. And so that actually brings us to, this is a real, this is a really good question that completely relates to what we were just talking about. If you had a day, on this made up island, what would you do? Oh, I God. would I would walk all over it. I would walk that cliffside. I would walk down to the artist colony. I would find my way through the labyrinth. And then I would find myself yeah. that incredible pool and lay by it for the rest of the exactly. day. And have people bring me strawberries and champagne. Yes, that does because not it comes with servants, so I would take full you advantage. Betcha. You betcha. You <laughs> betcha. Somebody make me a salad, please. <laughs> That's right. Oh, a salad. Thank you so much. I'm um, just looking at some of these other questions that I have here. Um, I oh, this is a really good one. Um, okay, are there any other 
large unanswered questions from older books you'd like to address like like we just discussed with Jane Eyre is there anything else that is there any other question that you have about um, a, another book and never like, say never never say never, never. Say never. but <laughs> this was this uh, you know this is not a retelling of Rebecca in yeah. any way shape or form but yeah no not at all it's it's got all the gothic thriller tropes in it mm -hmm. and making sure that the tropes were there that they weren't like rebecca but they were like rebecca and they you know all of that that's actually right. really a challenge um, yeah it's a challenge to create worlds that are homages to other worlds that other creatives right. have have created right. um right. and that's that's not something i think i would delve into again yeah so yeah yeah i am um, i i don't um so like i i mean for me like the confessions on the 745 was just a little bit of like a just like a tiny sliver of the idea of strangers on a train right which is a patricia patricia highsmith novel which most people know it is the alfred hitchcock film but probably this crew you know knows it better yeah this the, girl know it better than the book know, yeah <laughs> <laughs> they know they know better than like and Patricia Highsmith is such an amazing she's probably one of the greatest crime writers of all times I think but you know that was like you know it's it's the universe of somebody else's story is such a uh, such a personal such a personal thing you know like for me it was just like that I that idea of the one moment you know that one moment of connection that the liminal space where two strangers meet like especially like in a travel setting like you know um how you're like not the person you were when you came from that other place and you're not the person you're going to be when you get to that other place but you are both just somebody completely different in that moment like that energy like that was the only thing about that story that i wanted to explore you know, and I can't, but like, and I've never really had that with anything else. I've never had yeah. that, like, you know, feeling of like, I want to, I want to rewrite this story or I want to, you know, take this character and, and make something else happen. So I don't know that, I mean, again, never, you know, like you say, never say never, but I don't think I, I don't think there's any other, any other question that I have that would, is burning enough that would <laughs> allow me to. <laughs> I think if I did, it would harken back more on. to a mythological story, right? Something that yeah. you could really, you know, I think, I think what, what Madeline Miller did with Cersei is just astoundingly yeah. good. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it's just one of the best reimaginings I have right. ever seen. And that, you know, that lit a fire under me. I read that right before I started writing this book. And that certainly, yeah. you know, kind of lit the fire under me of, you know, there are ways to do this. There are ways to answer the questions and, and fill in the blanks of places that the other writers never went. They never maybe thought about it, saw it right. or didn't want to, right. you know, there are, there are holes in the canon that, that as modern authors, if we're mm. going to do something like that, we can fill them. I think that's why yeah, there's so many sure. authors right now. I mean, the, well, I have Margaret At Atwood talks about Lego pieces, right? Like she, she talks about, um, like, you know, taking a modern character and trying to put them into an older story and having them experience that, old, like that fairy tale or that myth or whatever it is from the perspective of this modern, modern character. Or like by the Lego pieces, she means like myths and fairy tales, mm -hmm. or even all like within your own family, like family stories that have taken on a certain significance or meaning about sure. people in the story. So using those pieces and, you know, she talks about like, it's really just a writing exercise, but she talks about, you know, having 10 characters or 10 settings or 10 fairy tales and you know, moving them about, plugging one into the other, which I think is kind of an interesting idea. But, you know, again, it's like, it's always so, it's so personal. Like when you feel that like spark for a story, you know, it can't come from anything out, outside yourself. I mean, it may, the idea may be something outside yourself, but it has to connect with something deep within. Otherwise, for me, it's, mm -hmm. there's no, there's no engine. There's, you have to have that personal engine, that 
fire in the belly to kind of get from, from you know, idea to completed novel. Sure. And it's, I mean, there's only seven plots, right? There's only seven right, plots. Well, so, so they say. So, so they, they say. say. So, yeah. I mean, you can give <laughs> so pen writers guy the said. same. I said it. Um, <laughs> It's you can you can give ten writers the exact same story and it will right. be something different. I've I've actually always wanted to write an outline for a book, give it to five writer friends, yes. and have everybody write it, and it's going right. to be completely different. Every single one yes. of them is going to be totally Absolutely. different. Absolutely, that would be, be a so good anthology. That would be a good short story anthology. Mm -hmm. You know, like a, the outline of a story for every, you know, and every every author takes it. And, does what they want to do. To yeah, it. I think that would be. I mean, I've done probably little gonna bits wind, of that. Probably going to wind up editing that together at some point. <laughs> Anything for you, my darling. <laughs> Anything for you. That would be fun. <laughs> it, I mean, it's a, it's a cool idea. I mean, that's it's it such is. a it's it it just harkens back to um, this is a really weird path I'm taking, but I did autopsies um, mm. for research and. Yeah. I dare anyone to say there isn't some sort of higher being, higher power, right. a spiritual plane. When you look inside everybody in that room, there were four bodies and they were all exactly the same inside. Uh, yeah. There's something yeah. that makes us who we are, something much more uh, ephemeral than, than the engine that we have. And that's, right. I think, what comes out in these creative stories. I mean, we just... Right. Have our yeah, own takes I mean, on like, everything. The idea that there's like there's only seven stories, like yeah, I, I hear that and I see that, but like I always think too that there are as many different stories as there are people. You know, it's like if you think about your own life, like just think about mm -hmm. your life with your parents and your your cousins or your siblings. It's like these events that occurred, like in your life, they mean something different to every single person. Every single person there had a mm -hmm. has a different story to tell about that one about that one moment you know and i think that that's really the heart of fiction right is like these different perspectives and these different ideas about you know about those seven stories like how are yep. how are these all these million different people experiencing those seven stories and how you know, even now in this moment where we're just kind of i think opening up to new um new ways that of looking at old, at old stories you know, things that we thought we really knew and really understood, like, you know, I'm thinking specifically of like Monica Lewinsky or like Tanya Harding or like Britney, Britney Spears. Spears. These are narratives that we thought we knew, that we realize now we didn't know at all. And mm -hmm. only because we're looking at it from this completely new perspective of like, you know, just open ears, open eyes, open to different voices and different layers to yeah. old stories. It's it's a fascinating moment to live in. I mean, I know every generation has their moment like this. Yes, um, of course. But it's it is a really fascinating moment that was coupled with a pandemic. Yes, I mean, and just just uh, I mean, it, you couldn't write Maybe this that and get away with it. Your editor would be like, "That's a little too on the nose." You know, there's enough going on. You don't need a pandemic too. Exactly. <laughs> you know, they would take that out of the pitch. <laughs> exactly. You just but, hear your editor going, "No." Do not. Yeah. There is no, no. We don't need the pandemic. No. There's way too we, much going on. Already. Too much already happening. We don't need a <laughs> pandemic. You've got enough here without throwing Focus. that in. <laughs> you know, that's that's what we find ourselves in. This moment yeah. where I really, honestly, come on, you can't write this. And it is going no. to change how everything is done and how everyone views everything. Yeah, and then it's like all of a sudden people are, you know, you're home and you're not living this like busy, addicted life anymore. And it's like all of a sudden people are finally paying attention to all the stuff that needed that we needed to be paying attention to. Like, right. like wait a minute, some of this stuff is really not working. Right. I mean, it, it's right? could we have had one without the other? Yeah, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think, think so either. I think they, I, I think everything that has happened in the past couple of years is had to happen. It was, it was. Yeah. Preordained. I Whoop. think it was. I think it was. <laughs> I was. I was what sitting happened? on my. I was sitting on my watch. 
I can't see because I have this question box. I have this like question box in front of me. It's blocking both of us. I'm like acting like it's a real thing. It's there. <laughs> that was my it's watch not, trying to call it's 911 just, for me. It was like because I was sitting on it. Call 911. It's getting too intense. Um, <laughs> so, there, <laughs> so there's one more. There's another question that I think is probably a good one to maybe finish on, or we might have a time for one more. But I. So the, we're talking about the island, how, you know, that this is a, you know, a figment of your imagination um, and all the more real for it. But so what about the art on this book? So can you talk about that? Did you have something to do with that? Or is yes. it like, did you draw this? I did not draw that as oh. we have, as we have uh, ascertained. We've covered that. Drawing right? ain't my thing. Um, but <laughs> I, you know, they asked me, you know, what do you, what does it look like and everything? So I pulled together my visuals of what I thought the island looked like. So I sent some pictures of, of Capri and the cliffs. And mm -hmm. the fortress is Sacre du Saint Michel, which is in Northern mm -hmm. Italy. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of how I envisioned the, the, the fortress that builds into basically George Clooney's villa off the coast uh, in Lake Como. Yeah. So I kind of, I, you know, I married. Which was also in Star things. Wars, right? Wasn't that also in Star Wars? I think so. so yeah. Something. Um, yeah. <laughs> we, you know, I put all of that together in an email and said, you know, here's, here's just some ideas. And they came yeah. back with this. And it was one of those moments where it's like, if you change anything, I will be so mad at you. I mean, they just knocked right. it out of the park. Boom. Bold Our art response. department is incredible. And it, it just yeah. could not be a more perfect cover. Yeah, it is. A, it's an absolutely stunning cover. It I, really is. I will hold and it, this up. It just encapsulates the story so perfectly. Yeah, it, it really does. It's a, it's a perfect, um, it's, yeah, and that's not always, that's, you know, as we know, not always the case. You know, I'm sure you've had your share of covers where you were just like, wait, what? What? No. <laughs> what is that supposed to be? <laughs> like, what is that? <laughs> but the last, my last two covers, I've literally yeah. just, yes, <laughs> yes, do not Yeah, I have anything. to say the same is true for me with, um, you know, with uh, with Park Row, they the Confessions on the Seven Forty Five is just an absolute. It's like it probably is one fantastic. Of, probably cover. one of my all time, probably all, one of my all time favorite covers. And when I saw it, I was just like, "Wow, this is it! It's perfect." It's, they're just very, It's a really like it's a they're they're quite the quite the team. Um, they, we we team. have we have the best artists in the business, hands down. Yeah, for I sure. really think we for do. Sure. Absolutely stunning. Um, Sean, we love work. you. If you see this, we love you. We love you. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, um, so what's up next for you? What's your next? What's your next? Um, what's your next appearance? Where, where are you going to be hanging <laughs> next out with next? I, I know it's on. You are with our other pal, Lisa. Gardner. Lisa Gardner. That was on Tuesday. Yeah, that, that was, was on, on Tuesday, Tuesday night. night. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so next, who else you hanging out this week? This uh, this is the end of the friend tour. I'm now <laughs> moving on to the solo part. Though I'm I'm going to be Hello. with Sue Lucy at page one fifty eight, and Sue is a friend, so she counts as a part of the friend tour. Perfect. Um, so she that's on Saturday. I've got a thing tomorrow that's uh, a library in New York, and uh, I'm going to be on Scared Straight Reads on Instagram Live on Sunday night. Um, and then oh, wow. there's a bunch, there's a bunch more. I still have, um, I still have a number of events to come and I'm just, you know, this has just been, it's been a really great week and being able to spend it with yeah. my besties has been awesome. Yeah, it's, it's great. It's, it's, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot to love, there's a lot to love about it. You know, I think we're all, we'll all be happy when we can like, hug each other again yeah. you know and like yeah. have drinks and sit across the table and have yeah, the time but for sure i think there's been some you know some really really nice blessings that you know again if you've been fortunate to be in that position there have been some there have been some good moments as well there has and it's all you know it's all in what you make of it it's just kind of how this life is yes yes absolutely 
Constance. Hi, Constance. I know. I I'm know not a pretty Constance from Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> I turned my camera on so I wouldn't creep you out, Lisa, with just a random voice poking in through the noise. You did have like that very like sort of soft mellifluous voice to you it's like it's like an angel or a fairy speaking it is it's very cool oh now <laughs> there's an true. idea yeah wow. i would love to be a book narrator that's like a secret like i would love to do narration stuff yeah anyway, random yeah. secret thing, i think it's but. like it's, a, it's just like a super specialized skill my like one of my sister's friends actually is one and it was really cool watching her like this is totally tangential, not even remotely related to what you were talking about. But it was really interesting watch her watching her build her career and getting into it. And it yeah, it was a really fascinating thing to watch um, her do. Yeah, it's an interesting. It's, and people who do it or do it just you know they're just amazing. It's just like such yeah. a such a special talent. Let me yeah, let really. me tell you, Brittany Presley narrates her dark lies and. <gasps> Uh, you know that I they they send me narrators to mm -hmm. listen to, and yeah. when I heard her, I'm like, she's Claire. That's yeah. it. I mean, hands yeah. down. I'm like, I wrote him back like within ten seconds. I said, please, please, please get Brittany for me. That's who I need for this book, and she yes. has knocked it out of the park. So if you like audiobooks, I'm sure yes. Mysterious Galaxy can hook you up. Oh, um, yeah, we can actually. Yeah, for sure, for sure. It, it, yeah, she's and, done an amazing job. So if you're yeah, Vivian Lahaney is the one who did um, Confessions on the 745. Same exact thing. Like, wow, she's just amazing. Nailed it. She's nailed it. Yeah, it's just great. Huge talent. And if you guys are interested in audiobooks, if you go to our website, when you click on the book, Libro FM is the um, indie equivalent for audiobooks. And they're an amazing, they're just yeah. honestly a joy to work with. And they make it really easy. And they have very good comparable options compared to other things that shall not be said in the indie space out there. But um, when you go to our website, we're actually connected to Libra Films with the audiobooks available. It will like pop up as an option where you can click on the link. So I know, oh my gosh, I love a good narrator. It's like the best, oh, best yeah. thing in the world. You know, it can make or break. It can make a break or book. We could have a whole other hour conversation plus on that if I don't. <laughs> Because it's so true. Yeah, no, but, it's, um, it's totally true. I want to thank you so very much, Lisa and JT, for joining us. Like, thank you. it was thank such you, a pleasure you. getting to hear you guys speak. Like, you can, it, you're just both honestly like, this was a treat. This was a treat just getting to hear you guys talk and letting us into your world as authors and also into thank the world you. of our dark lives. Thank so, you. thank you. We love wonderful. Mysterious Galaxy, and it's been way—it's been way too long since I have visited the actual store, and so we'll look forward to that again. And you know, just and just to say to everybody who's watching, you know, just make sure you know. Obviously, we can't ever slag on the big guys because you know they have their place and they employ a lot of people, and you know we have to support everybody. But you know, our indies are—you know—they are the you know, the heart and soul of our communities. They are yes. the backbone of our industry. And so we just want to always make sure that especially when you do come out to events and stuff that you, you know, support your indie stores because they mean so much to authors and readers and to the, the towns where, you know, everybody just counts on them as like the place to go to like go visit books because everybody who is a reader knows that they want to like, you know, just go touch books somewhere. I mean, we all want that, right? <laughs> Thank you yeah. so, so much. Just support your indie store, especially when you come out for an event. It's it's an important thing. For sure, that, for sure. Well that means so much. Thank you. Yeah, like I couldn't have said that better myself. Thank you so much. We get to have events because people buy books for the authors they come to see. So yes. Oh my gosh. I, yes. I really couldn't have said that any better. So I'm not even going to ramble on and ruin the eloquent and like eloquence <laughs> and beauty of what you just said. So on that note, <laughs> shameless plug, go buy her dark lie. <laughs> and this was such a pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you so much, JT. And everyone, we will see you on the your best. Time. Congratulations. Amazing. Have a good night. Love speaking to you. Bye.